deflation, not inflation, is the true threat. Interesting. Let's dive into this article I saw from, I think it's Seeking Alpha. Yeah, Seeking Alpha. Uh, Hale Stewart. Let's see if we can see a, uh, he's got 7,800 followers, so good stuff, man. Uh, wrote, he had written this on September 5th, 2005. It was just the other day I read this. Pretty good article. I've been wanting to read it. For, is we got a, I don't see, uh, I don't know say anything about Hale, like what his background is or who he is. So, uh, not that I can see. All right. So let's take a look. This is pretty good. Uh, globally, inflation has been a, has been weak for the last 20 years. There are a number of intertwined reasons for this, and as a result, there's little chance of seriously inflation pressures. Deflation is a fact of greater threat. Let me hold on just a second. One of my subscribers had told me about this book right here, The Failure of the uh, of uh, Holy Grail uh, Macroeconomics by Richard Koo. And this, I tell you, man, this this was incredibly informative when it comes to understanding why deflation is upon us as opposed to inflation. I thought I had it back there on the, uh, oh, there it is. Hold on a second. I think I see it. Here it is. The Holy Holy Grail Macroeconomics Lessons from Japan's Great Recession. It's, uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it's insane how I got so many things on here, uh, right here. So I'm just, I just literally pulled this. So this is page 88. In a balance sheet recession, firms seek to reduce their debt to presentable levels as quickly as possible. Before journalists and analysts discovered that their balance sheets were actually underwater, the uh, firms they also stop reinvesting earnings in the business. And they no longer borrow household se sector savings. These behavioral changes reduce aggregate demand and weaken the economy. When a contraction of aggregate demand sends the economy into a tailspin, spin, the central bank's natural response is to ease monetary policy by lowering rates. <laughs> In this type of recession, however, the economy fails to respond because the corporate sector is in debt minimization mode, and when continued monetary accommodation fails to turn the economy around, the central bank panics, dropping interest rates to near zero level. Still nothing happens, and the economy falls in what co economists call a liquidity trap. The economics literature describes a liquidity trap as a situation when interest rates fall to such low levels that money, cash, and bonds become perfect substitutes. At that point, suppliers of funds choose to hold cash instead of lending the funds at low rates because there's no one there to borrow. Get that book. Uh, okay, excuse me there, guy. Remember, paw the like button when Paolo makes an appearance. Yeah, a little snake. All right, anyways, just, and we're doing the same thing. I mean, it's just, there's a, a debt, uh, not a debt, a, uh, a demand. Uh, people just aren't, they're just, they're going to save more than spend because they're worried about the next hit to us. I mean, think about this, my friends. And we'll get in the article in just a second. They could shut down on a whim. On a on a freaking severe flu, uh, that they shut down everything. If you look at Australia, it's insane what these guys are doing. If they can do that in the Western world, we're not China, we're not a totalitarian state. What they could do it again and again and again. So what do you do? You say I'm going to park some money in savings. I got to have money in reserve. I don't care what the interest rates are. I'm not going to borrow. Now we did. We put a pool in because we want that to be used, so we don't have to go on vacation. We can stay here. Other than that, though. Why would you borrow? You're not going to borrow if you just because rates are low. You say, no, I'm going to hoard, which is what causes deflation. All right, so let's read what my man says. Uh, the Federal uh, Open Market Committee announced, uh, adjusted its strategy for achieving its long-run inflation goal 2% by noting it seeks to achieve inflation that averages 2% uh, uh, over time. However, Following periods when inflation has been running persistently below 2%, appropriate monetary policy will likely aim to achieve inflation moderately above the 2% for some time. I'm telling you, man, this is where cash, I just, the, the concern is when people are not borrowing, when there's a demand recession, i.e. people do not want to invest, spend, and they don't want to borrow regardless of how low the interest rates are, when they have that demand recession, uh, the Fed can say, okay, the interest rates aren't low, so what do we do next? Oh, they penalize you for holding cash is what happens. But anyway, there are several reasons for the change. The first is that the market interpreted the previous symmetrical program as imposing an inflation ceiling. 
Uh, the term has been interpreted by many observers to mean that the committee's reaction function aimed to symmetric on either side of the 2% inflation goal and that the open market committee set the policy aim that 2% should represent an inflation ceiling. It won't go above that. Uh, uh, in which economic expansion is following economic d downturns in which inflation falls below the, mar uh, the, the uh, target. All right, so this is going back to 2002. And now we can see this is a uh, CPI, Consumer Price Index. You can see it's been below 2%. There's there's 2% right there. I mean, <laughs> it's been below 2% since 2009. Look at that. Yeah, look at that. It hasn't come anywhere near 2%. And that's the EU's core inflation rate, by the way. It lasted 2% in 2007 and 9. So that's the EU. Here's Japan. Look at this. Uh, here's the uh, percent change from year over year. Uh, the blue line shows the absolute value of CPI. Look at that. It's just flat. So it's, this is from 1960. Gone up until right about there. That's in 19, about uh, 1996. It happens to coincide with their... Now a 25-year lost decade. I mean, they've been calling it a lost decade, but it's a lost decade for two and a half uh, uh, score. Whoa, one score and five years ago when Japan last had any major inflation. Look at that. That's the CPI on a core basis. That's nuts, man. All right, so uh, that's the blue line. The red line shows the year-to-year-over-year -year price change in CPI. You can see that's zero right there. I mean, it's just... <laughs> Nuts, man. All right, so here we go. Above is a year-to-year, -year, a year-over-year -year change in core CPI, and what? Uh, uh, let's see. Above is a chart for the year-over-year -year change in core core CPI and the CPI uh, price index in red. Both have very, been very tame. Is this in the U.S.? Yeah, I think this is in the U.S. Look at that. Just, I mean, just again for 25 years, nothing, man. I don't care about the love mix anyway. Uh, so the data leads to the conclusion. In the developed world, deflation is far more a threat than inflation. There are four reasons for this. First, the EU, U.S., and Japan's population has been trending older. As this occurs, people save more and consume less. You just can't debate that anymore. Again, going back to this article from EBRI, again, uh, how do retiree spending patterns change over time? They, they reduce. It doesn't mean they run out of money. They're just not. They're just reduced because they spend less. They save more. The former increases the amount of available funds while the latter demand pull pressures. Again, Richard Koo talks about this. Both lead to lower inflation. Uh, this is first explained by Bernanke in his Global Savings Glut paper. Second, increased global competition has helped to contain costs. Third, increased price transparency, especially as a result the web, has given purchasers more negotiating power. Fourth, the deunionization of U.S. labor force has lowered wage pressures. I, I actually completely agree with that, 100%. And I'm not sure it's a good thing. I used to think it was a good thing. Now, uh, given the corporate uh, allegiance uh, to the far left, Black Lives Matter, you know, not criticizing anything that could be misperceived, you know, Antifa can, you know, state their names and, and everyone's like, okay, but if you even say you're Republican, how dare you? uh bringing back some kind of union would uh would solve that absolutely absolutely um it's, it's that's not good deunionization has led to corporate america running amok on your civil liberties absolutely as an employee and on top of that uh their adherence to a far left globalist agenda has led uh to to keeping wages under control there's no other way around that look i'm the first to admit i was the biggest anti-union guy for many many moons and i'm not like that anymore now, we don't want a union like the freaking teachers union, which is far left and using our tax money. But at the end of the day, private sector unions, we need to rethink this for sure because they're done. They're done right now. I don't think that's good. Now, let's return to the Fed's statement about inflation. They said they would tolerate a 2% average rate of inflation using simple numbers. Let's say the PCE uh, uh, index is 1% for 10 months. It would have to run at 3% for the next 10 months before Fed would raise rates. So we have a low inflation, have to have a high inflation before Fred, the Fed even raised rates because the 2% is a target. But, uh, at this point, some people argue that inflation could run out of control, but that ignores a basic fact. Deflation is now the primary threat to the U.S. economy. Inflation is just is not a problem now because we've had low inflation for so long, even if their 2% price target is here, we've been so far underneath it for so long that have to take a huge amount of time to even break the 2% on average. Uh, for those of us who came of age during the 70s and 80s, the idea of tolerating higher inflation seems an anathema. anathema. Uh, 
Uh, but Paul Volcker successfully broke inflation in the early 80s to bring in the great moderation. I still think we should give more uh, cred to uh, Jimmy Carter and Ted Kennedy, believe it or not. Now, the possibility of an extended period of deflation is far greater. The Fed is now doing everything it can to encourage and cultivate pricing pressure, which, uh, which I mean, like Richard Koo says, just because you can encourage it doesn't mean it's going to happen. So could not agree uh, more of that. Um, worldwide infl uh, inflation, well, okay, so this guy says inflation is well over 2% when tuition, medical expenses, and housing are included. Well, medical expenses... And housing are uh, are issues for sure, but from a consumption perspective, uh, not everyone has medical expenses. They just don't. And housing, to be perfectly honest, with you, the way you do that is you just buy a fixed rate mortgage, and then you're done. In fact, inflation eats away at the housing cost for sure. I would actually argue, but that's not even has nothing to do with the Fed anyway. They can't control housing. That's regulatory environments and how and, and housing for sure, and even medical stuff. Regulatory environments that says, look. We're going to uh, force, we're going to limit the amount of growth. We're going to put and make you put solar panels. We're going to make you do this, make you do that. And that's one of the regulatory causes of inflation for housing that the Fed can't have anything to do with. So anyway, hope you like this. I am actually more worried about deflation than inflation. I've been saying this since I started this channel. Um, and especially since my man gave me this book on Richard Koo. It's just fantastic. Right, we'll see. I'll put a link in the show notes if you want. We'll see you.